Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for connecting with us tonight to our org event on facial recognition, a topic that has become central stage in the past month in the context of the controversial trials of this technology in public spaces in England and Wales in the UK, but also in the context of the recent pro-democracy demonstration in Hong Kong and the Black Lives Matter campaign for racial justice in the US, among other things. So my name is Justin Gonier, and I'm part of Open White uh, Group Glasgow. For those of you who don't know, Open White Groups is a UK-based digital campaigning organization working to protect your rights to privacy and free speech online. Please check out the website for future events and more information about what we do and how to get involved. So just to let you know, the event tonight is recorded and will be made available on the org YouTube channel where you can also check the past event. Tonight, we have an exciting lineup, and I look very much forward to taking uh, part in this conversation with our speakers and our audience. I'm delighted to introduce our three fantastic speakers. So first, uh, we will hear uh, from Benedetta Catanzaretti, who is a PhD candidate in science, technology, and innovation studies at the University of Edinburgh. She's researching the relationship between surveillance, AI, and society. Her academic background is in philosophy, and she's currently looking at the design of the classification techniques underpinning the development and use of automated facial and affect recognition systems. Second, we will hear from Eric Chaudhry, who is the founder and director of Web Roots Democracy, a London-based think tank advocating for progressive and inclusive technology policy. He has recently published a report entitled Unmasking Facial Recognition, an exploration of the racial bias implication of facial recognition surveillance in the United Kingdom. Eric has worked at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, London City Hall, the UK Parliament and Future Advocacy. And he has provided commentary on technology policy issues for a range of media outlets. Last but not least, our third speaker tonight is Lachlan Urquhart, who is lecturer in technology law at the University of Edinburgh. He has a multidisciplinary background in computer science and law, and is conducting research at the intersection of human-computer interaction, ubiquitous computing, data protection, and cybersecurity. Lachlan is currently working on a major research project entitled Emotional AI in Cities, cross-cultural lesson from the UK and Japan on designing for ethical life. The project examined the social, technical governance and cultural dimensions of emotional sensing technology in urban life. So tonight, each of the panelists will speak for about 12 to 15 minutes, and we will have then more of a panel discussion and take questions from the audience. So I'm very pleased to report that we have a high number of people connecting and connected to this call. So please submit your question to our speakers throughout the event, and we will try to take as many as possible in the second half of the, of the seminar. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to Benedetta. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Justine. That was um, great. Um, well, hi, everyone, um, and thank you, uh, Justine and Mike and Open Rights uh, Group for organizing this uh, exciting panel. Um, it's been a long time coming, and finally, we're here today. Um, my name is Benedetta Catanzariti, and I am a PhD student in Science, Technology, and Innovation Studies at the University of Edinburgh. Um, to give you a little bit of background, um, my research focuses on the social dimensions that shape the design of facial and emotion recognition technology. And uh, I look at how cultural factors and varied intersecting notions of identity and facial expressions might infuse the design process of these systems. Um, al alongside my PhD research, um, in recent months, I've been working with a colleague from the Edinburgh College of Arts, Sarah Bennett. Um, we've been work working on a project that explores the data collection and labeling practices that are involved in the creation of facial recognition data sets. Uh, particularly, we are interested in the process of labeling face images that is uh, carried out by gig workers, such as uh, Amazon Mechanical Turkers, if you have ever heard of um, 
of them. Um, we are interested in how the material condition of, of gig labor itself might impact on such practice and uh, what is the, the, the role of gig labor itself in, within the AI pipeline. And what I mean with material condition is the fact that, um, for example, a gig worker is paid an average of 0.2 to point, uh, sorry, 0.02 to 0.08 dollars per image. Um, and, or for example, the fact that they don't have any established uh, legal status as workers. Um, what I would like to do today in these next uh, 10, uh, uh, 12 minutes is to look at the history of facial recognition technology. And I should say that uh, while I'm not an historian of technology or an historian of science myself, um, I am looking at the assumptions and expectation that shape this technology. And so I believe it's crucial to understand where these assumptions and expectations come from. Um, so facial recognition has an origin story, a mythical origin story that begins uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, when multiple actors, um, law authorities and scientists, professional developers, uh, journalists, uh, they all claimed at some point that facial recognition technology could have prevented the terrorist attack, uh, attacks of 9-11. Um, and in so doing, the way presenting facial recognition as an already existing and reliable technical solution to what at the time uh, um, was recognized as the most uh, pressing problem of modern uh, Western society, recognizing the enemy. Uh, but what this claim does is effectively erasing the history of this technology and the historical continuities between contemporary facial recognition systems and a particular way of looking at the face that emerged well before 9-11 and that is embedded in long-standing cultural practices of social classification. Uh, the idea that the body and especially the face could be used as a marker of identity and that it could be used to sort individuals into social groups was central to uh, the many theories of physiognomy uh, that proliferated in the Victorian society. Um, what is physiognomy? It's the idea that by observing and measuring someone's facial features, we can actually capture their inner truth. Um, and historian Sharona Perra has described physiognomy in Victorian society as a subjective science for everyone, a popular means of entertainment uh, by which social hierarchies could be established, but without too much of a scientific authority. Um, it's really with the invention of uh, photography and the creation of large archives that these cultural practices became systematic. And the famous example is uh, Alphonse Bertillon's system called Bertillonage. Uh, Bertillon was in charge of the Paris Prefecture of Police's archive of criminal images, and he developed an identification system that would allow police officers to easily recognize recidivists. Um, he, um, he was facing, on the one hand, uh, the difficulty of identifying second-time offenders, and on the other hand, the inconvenience of navigating tens of thousands of accumulated criminal photographs. And so he designed a protocol, protocol of uh, body measurement, anthropometric measurement, and a classification system that would make it easier to connect criminals with the record. Uh, police officers would take a photograph of the criminal, uh, together with detailed anthropometric measurements and arrange such information in a mathematical order. Another famous example uh, is uh, Francis Galton comp composite portrait. His aim was not practical, it was not interested in identifying single criminals. Uh, he had a theoretical purpose by overprinting on hundreds of photographs of individuals that he believed to be of the same type, such as the criminal, um, or as you can see in this slide, the Jew. Uh, Galton hoped to generate portraits of ideal characters and materialize the visual, visual evidence of what he believed were hereditarian laws. Um, and so while Bertillon was concerned with the identification of this singular criminal body, uh, Galton aimed at discovering the criminal body, the one representation of every criminal, a shift from individual identification to group classification that we have witnessed in these recent years in recognition technologies. But uh, crucial to both these projects is the rise in the 19th century of social statistics and the concept of average man. Bertillon translated the measurements of facial features into numbers and organized his archive around the principle of below average, average, and above average. 
And Galton applied the same concept to photography, believing that he had found a way to translate the statistical concept of average into a visual form. And it's interesting to see how um, in the, early in the early 90s, uh, the first successful facial recognition algorithm, the eigenphase algorithm, uh, which was developed by the MIT, was a digitized version of Galton's composite portrait. Here, eigenphase recognizes faces by layering multiple phases and calculating the range of variation between images. So I think we should keep this historical example in mind when we look at facial recognition system, and especially, as I mentioned before, um, those systems that claim to recognize not only individual identities, but also things like mental states, feelings, personality traits, criminality. Um, so, and uh, in this sense, in, in recent, uh, recently, we have seen a proliferation of uh, academic papers published on very well-established peer-reviewed journals that repropose and reproduce these assumptions into the field of computer science and psychology. Um, and using facial recognition to predict things such as criminality, again, as I mentioned before, trustworthiness, and even sexuality. And so they fit into a research trend that explores what I would call um, digitized physiognomy. And I think that these examples show that um, first, despite the fact that physiognomy has been discarded as fundamentally bad science, uh, many of today's systems are still deeply embedded in the same uh, racist and sexist assumptions. And secondly, and uh, this is my final point because I think I'm uh, running out of time. I think that in light of this history um, and these historical continuities, when we hear of facial recognition gone wrong, uh, I think we should push back against this idea that we only need to make the technology more accurate, that we need a technical fix and we just need to de-bias the data and providing more data and more representation. Um, I think that these kind of solutions do not su sufficiently problematize the technology and we should instead be concerned with the kind of question being asked and the kinds of methods used uh, when not only these technologies are designed but also funded. Um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to this cash result. I think I will stop here and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I really enjoyed your presentation uh, and now I think I will pass the floor to Eric. Um, yeah. Cool. Oh. I don't have a screen to share, so it's just me. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for organising this. Thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is Arik. I'm the founder and director of WebRoots Democracy, which, as Justine said, is a think tank focused on progressive and inclusive technology policy. What does that actually mean? Um, it's focused on looking at ways we can use technology in a way that reduces things like discrimination, creates a more inclusive society, and also, also pushes for more uh, interventionist uh, public policy on technology to contrast with what I view as quite a libertarian um, uh, background to technology policy over the last 20 years. And uh, so we look at a lot of different areas in technology. One of them was uh, facial recognition technology, which we just published a report on called Unmatching facial recognition and as Benedetta just said a lot of the driver behind it was um, a lot of the drive, driving force behind the report was the idea that accuracy or the focus on on accuracy is a big distraction when it comes to uh, discussing the racial bias aspect of the technology so a lot of mainstream discussion on facial recognition technology um, over the last couple of years when it comes to race has been around uh, does it work as well on different ethnicities and there are a couple of good papers in the US which demonstrated how they don't work as well on uh, people of color and especially women of color and there's a gender uh, gender bias and race bias now you can look up that paper it's called gender shades I think and whilst that's a really important uh, issue like if we're to have facial recognition, it should work accurately on everyone. Um, it doesn't really highlight all of the, the broad range of issues around uh, racial bias when it comes to surveillance. So in particular, um, it doesn't look at, for example, what this technology is being used for, why it's being deployed, for what uh, political purpose, what is the context within which it's being deployed, what is the history of its deployment, um, as again Benedetta mentioned, 
uh, but equally it doesn't also touch upon the impact it may have on religious minorities, uh, in particular women who wear the niqab and uh, Muslims in the UK who are already a heavily surveilled group. Um, so what this um, report did, we got some funding from the Joseph Rowntree Reform Trust, which is a funder that does work on civil liberties. And we did a literature review which looked primarily on the historical um, nature of surveillance more generally. So if you go back, some of, if you go back in, in history, some of the earliest examples of surveillance uh, are in the slave uh, in in the U.S. during slave uh, during slavery, where they had something called the Lantern Laws, where slaves were made to carry lanterns and ID documents when they went out on their own at nighttime, right? So they could be more easily identified. And again, on the on the slave ships, many things like fingerprinting and, and other forms of ID and surveillance were pioneered. Uh, during that period. And if you fast forward to the modern day, you know, post 9 11, uh, you know, you've seen a growth in, growth in CCTV surveillance, but you've also seen things like the Prevent Program and Counter Extremism surveillance programs, which have all had quite a racial element to it. So a lot of it was trying to situate this technology within that societal context. And given things, given um, studies which have found uh, the Metropolitan Police to be institutionally racist, what does facial, what role does facial recognition play in that context? So in addition to this literature review, we did expert roundtables, uh, we did interviews, workshops with people of colour, um, and we also submitted freedom of information requests to the Metropolitan Police and to South Wales Police to just understand how they were actually approaching this issue and what we found was that the Metropolitan Police didn't do inequalities impact assessment um, before they trialled the technology across London which is actually quite shocking given the nature of the technology given how well documented a lot of the issues are and also given the, the kind of scrutiny that you would think the Metropolitan Police would, have, would apply to uh, you know issues of discrimination. So the fact that they deploy that technology despite having zero understanding really of how it would impact different um, minority groups. That was quite a shocking finding. But South Wales Police, who did do an equalities impact assessment, theirs was essentially a, a tick box exercise, which didn't really go into any kind of meaningful detail. And both these areas, South Wales is the, the highest ethnic minority population area in Wales, and uh, London has 40% BME uh, population, and the areas which it was trialled were things like the Notting Hill Carnival, which is a popular um, British Caribbean festival, but also places like Newham, which is a high ethnic minority population as well. Um, so a lot of the research was looking at how do we articulate that even if the technology is accurate on different ethnic groups, that is very likely to have a particular impact on those groups regardless. So a lot of it looked at existing data sets, such as the Lamy Review, which I highly recommend people read if they haven't uh, done so already. It has a huge, um, it's a huge piece of research into racial discrimination in the criminal justice system beyond the policing. And given that facial recognition technology hasn't been widely deployed yet, it's really difficult to make the argument that it will be used in a discriminatory way. And therefore, the only thing you can really do is look at how previous technologies have been used, things like tasers, things like CCTV, things like stop and search, and then say, well, given that this is the nature of policing and the criminal justice system, it is likely, therefore, that a new technology would have similar, similar effects. Um, but that's quite a difficult argument to make, and it's, you know, it can never be conclusive until after the event, by which point I think it would be too late. Um, we also did a test of a publicly available facial recognition system called BetaFace, which is used by uh, BAE Systems, which is a weapons manufacturer, but also big companies like Disney. Um, and the purpose of this test, uh, we used 300 um, members of parliament. Uh, we put them through this facial recognition system, including every single BAME MP. And the purpose of that exercise was just to get a better understanding of how these systems actually work and to see what kind of issues may crop up in other facial recognition systems. 
And the really interesting thing about this one, it's more of a facial analysis system. So it tells you things like what ethnicity is the person, what age, are they smiling, do they have a beard? Um, but it also included an attractiveness rating, which is a really subjective um, data point, right? Which so it gives it quite a good insight into how uh, bias may crop up or, or how developers might view different people. And the, the starkest finding in that was um, all black MPs were rated as unattractive, right? Every single one. Um, and there was like higher inaccuracy levels. Uh, a lot of a lot of issues um, cropped up, specific to um, MPs of African Caribbean heritage. So it wasn't just like the darker you are, the more issues that there are. It was very specific anti-blackness, anti-black issue within that particular system. And therefore, one of our findings were that there may be actually a broader issue to facial recognition beyond like skin tone. Uh, but actually different ethnic groups. Um, so it's, it's quite a wide ranging report looking at these different issues. Um, the main recommendation within it is for there to be a generational ban on facial recognition technology. The, what that means is basically uh, we should not use facial recognition for surveillance until we've overcome uh, institutional racism in these organizations, which has already been established and is already evidenced by lots of different studies. Because if you accept that there are these problems in society, there's no way you should give more power to the police, right? And we've seen this already with the use of tasers as, as used uh, disproportionately against black people. The COVID fines, there's a recent study which showed that's also been uh, disproportionately used against BAME people. And the purpose of a generational ban is, is more to signal to policymakers that you need to address this problem of racism or, or, or you know, direct or indirect before you start considering these highly intrusive technologies. Uh, but I can talk a bit more about that in the q and I'm worried that maybe I've uh, rambled on for quite a while. Thank you. So uh, yeah, and thank you to, to Justine and, and Mike and everyone at Pet.org for organising this and to my fellow speakers. It's a really interesting um, event. I'm, I'm glad to be part of it. Um, so, in my talk, I'm going to be thinking a little bit about where we're going next with some of this technology and looking beyond perhaps some of the discussions we've also already had about facial recognition and start thinking a little bit about motion recognition and picking up on um, some of the points that Benedetta made about maybe some of the history of this technology and trying to, to understand um, how people are feeling internally and, and their intent. Um, so just to kind of give a bit of background as to where I'm coming from with this particular presentation. Um, so as mentioned at the start, um, one of the projects we worked on last year with, with some colleagues um, from, from Bangor University and also um, Asia Pacific groups in, in, in Japan um, doing some work uh, to see sort of cross-cultural dimensions of uses of emotional AI in both the UK and Japan. So I'll pick up on some findings from a report we did um, there and then we have some ongoing work at the moment and um, looking at how these technologies might be deployed in, in smart cities in both, both countries as well, a, a larger project thinking about sort of commercial policing and, and civic context so we're doing a lot of kind of co-design work with different communities and uh, interviews with companies and understanding how the police are maybe using these, these technologies and things so yeah if this isn't just people in the audience and please get in touch afterwards and also a paper I've written with the professor Andy McStay and um, looking at some of these issues as well so emotional AI, as, as it's been coined by Andrew McStay, is um, the use of effective computing and AI techniques to sense, gauge, learn and interact and stimulate, simulate understanding of human emotional life. So you can see the goal here is to try and make emotional life visible. Um, but some of the challenges here are thinking a little bit deeper around you know, who's seeing this and why are they trying to understand emotional states um, and how are they doing it? So some of the use cases which have emerged um, for this, you know, it's very much an emerging technology. Um, but we have seen, as is often the case with, with new technologies, advertising interest in this space. Um, so trying to get better um, comprehension of consumer habits and often in sort of real real time spaces as well. So in sort of smart retail analytics, that's been one uh, quite popular one. Um, but one that's growing quite significantly is in the smart transportation space. So there's been recent legislation at the EU level trying to put in place a um, more advanced kind of distraction warnings and monitoring technologies into vehicles for, for safety purposes. And but part of this is trying to sense people's state and their tension. Um, and actually, it's interesting, given we look at the, the legislation, it does go into um, some, some points around the use of the data and trying to kind of 
make sure that third parties don't get access to this and to try and delete it as soon as possible and kind of privacy by design type measures but I thought it was quite interesting to see them being built in at that stage given the awareness that it could be quite intrusive to have a, a camera pointing at you as you're, you're driving around and other people wanting to access that but some of the technologies for sensing and um, motion are also the similar kind of technologies for this so with, I think we think the sort of automotive space will be a big one for this technology and also entertainment um, I had some colleagues in my old job who'd been using sort of emotion sensing tech to mod to modify the narrative of a, a film the moment and um, there's also been interest from sort of virtual reality and also um, voice interfaces as well but I thought it'd be interesting just to kind of give a little bit of a background as to how these technologies are normally modeling emotion um, so a lot of it builds from this model of universal basic emotions, um, so Ekman and Friesen's work from the, the late 70s. And what they've done is they developed this taxonomy, um, the facial action coding system taxonomy, where they've mapped um, different movements of the face onto seven basic emotions. So joy, surprise, sadness, anger, fear, disgust and contempt. And by the, the presence of different um, facial movements, there was a, a sort of correspondence being made to particular emotions, emotional states being present. So if you think about, um, you know, computer vision technologies, which are, are image-based, looking at different faces and perhaps labelling training data sets with different emotions and training up a system, uh, you know, pictures of faces which are sensibly showing joy because of the upturned lips and the smile in the eyes and things like that, then, you know, this is obviously quite popular from a a technical perspective but from a psychological perspective there's been a bit of skepticism over the years as to can you really detect someone's internal emotional state and there was a big study last year where there were uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett and others uh, thinking a bit about you know the importance of the context in which the emotion is being displayed and how you can't really necessarily infer everything just from the presence of these facial features but you also need to understand a bit more about the situation in which the emotion is being um, portrayed, you know, the cultural context, aspects of the individual, the fact that emotions can mean one, more than one thing, you know, a smile doesn't always mean that you're happy, it could be a sarcastic smile, it could be a, a smile of, of, of annoyance, you know, so there's, there's various ways in which we use um, emotions and this was to try and um, say that actually we maybe need to think about going beyond just this focus on facial coding um, and what we're starting to see is the increased interest in understanding context and using other kinds of sensors that are both on and off the body um, to try and read and to correlate with perhaps um, facial data. So such as, you know, um, listening to people's voices and trying to understand from the pitch and tone, um, you know, what particular state someone's in. Um, you know, if, if there's text involved, you can start to use natural language processing and doing sort of sentiment analysis to see if there's pairings of particular words that are maybe suggesting um, particular feelings, even down to things like people's gait um, and how, how they're walking has been uh, an, an area of interest in this space. <clears throat> and then obviously things from devices, um, you know, if you want to know where someone is when they're feeling a certain way, then location data is obviously quite important. And as we're moving to more and more edge-based analytics, um, obviously trying to understand what's on going on in devices, there's, there's more scope for analytics scope capacity, capacity there as well. So in this paper, um, we were kind of interested in thinking a little bit about how this fits into some of the data protection um, protections that we, we have. In particular, where you know, the goal of this technology, um, facial action coding, is often not to actually identify anybody, you know, unlike perhaps with facial recognition, where that very much is the goal. Here, it's not, you're not trying to necessarily single somebody out. It's more focused on trying to detect how they're feeling. Um, so we were kind of worried about, you know, how do we deal with this issue where it's maybe more interested in, in intent than perhaps um, identifying and had a little bit of a think about you know, within the facial recognition um, context, there's been a lot of discussion around biometric data and how, um, you know, the, the extra protections that you get in data protection law when you're processing special category data, more sensitive data, you know, the higher thresholds for the lawfulness of that processing. So, um, you know, explicit consent or if it's not obtaining explicit consent, then you know, it being in the, the um, substantial public interest and things like that. So having a look at the definition of, of uh, biometric data, 
you know, as there's no identification ongoing, it kind of feels like official action code employee doesn't necessarily fall under this remit. So, um, you know, if you look here, it's allowing or confirming the unique identification of, of an individual. Um, so yeah, we were just kind of, you can have a look at the prepared purposes of interest, but it kind of goes into a bit more detail about um, perhaps some of the limitations here and also the way in which um, maybe the spatial action coding data could be deemed sort of mental health data and then might more clearly come under the remit of that. But yeah, it was just having a little bit of a, an assessment of the limitations here. And I think this um, report from the European Data Protection Board was quite interesting, just insofar as it was given in a little bit more detail on um, processing of personal data through video devices. And so it felt like these two provisions I've just put in here kind of um, captured perhaps what some of these technologies are doing when you know they're they're being used to distinguish categories of people but not necessarily uniquely identify you know in this this report they say well that's that's not biometric data um, or if in the advertising context as i mentioned earlier this this stuff's being used used in advertising you know if shop owners are customizing ads using cameras capturing age and gender but they don't generate biometric templates in order to uniquely identify persons but instead just detects physical characteristics and only classifies a person that way then the processing wouldn't fall under an official category either. So, yeah, just trying to disaggregate a little bit where this um, type of data collection and use falls. And I think it's important to remember that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, facial action coding is, um, you know, we're moving to a position where it's, it's not enough just to focus on that. There's a need for more contextual data. And I think there, you know, it's, it's maybe going to be clearer that if you're collecting lots of other things, such as um, by people's location or using other identifying data to try and build up a picture of where someone is and um, you know then there will be say that greater scope to identify and um, so it'll be harder for a controller to argue that they're not identifying somebody but um, yeah so just some things to think about there on the limitations um, in the data protection framework perhaps for this type of data and I think I've got a little bit more time so I'm just going to go through just because I think it's interesting to think about some of the cross-cultural uh, dimensions here of, of how we're seeing emotional um, AI evolve in both the UK and Japan. Um, so as I mentioned, we did some um, a, a project last year uh, where we had done some workshops, uh, multi-stakeholder work, multi -stakeholder workshops um, with people from business, from government, from academia and so forth. Have a little bit of a think around how these technologies are, are going to be used. And it was just interesting to see, you know, some of the ways in which the harms um, coming from um, most facial, rec facial recognition and emotional recognition um, were, were conceptualized. So in Japan, uh, one of the findings that we all, all found quite interesting was, you know, there had been, the concern was not necessarily that it was invading people's privacy, it was more around, it was sort of seen as disrespectful, these technologies were almost being rude um, and not kind of having sufficient etiquette to, to citizens by putting these things in place. So uh, one example some participants brought up was around in Osaka, there was a, a facial recognition system um, deployed in a train station and eventually it was removed and this was partly on the basis that it was deemed to be you know kind of impolite and not um easily um, yeah so I, I thought we thought that was quite a, an interesting framing um to, to, to build from furthermore um the fact that you know this sort of emotion sensing might be embedded in existing technologies a lot more so that's why i think to me it's a, a concern seeing the infrastructure that's being developed from for the for the facial recognition side that could maybe be augmented and have this um, kind of emotion um, tracking built in as well. Um, in, in Japan, so sort of the aging population was, was very much a motivation for thinking about things like putting this in vehicles, like the, the European um, Safety Directive I mentioned earlier, and uh, regulation I should say, um, you know, there it was also, well, this could be a good thing for, for monitoring to kind of avoid elder crashes and things like that. And also just, the sort of the level of emotional attachment um, and the sort of relations between human and machine in Japan was something that was quite in contrast to, to in the UK. So, you know, there was much more openness to sort of emotional attachment engagement with, with non-human entities and the way in which often technologies are designed, um, you know, thinking like robots like the Love It. Uh, I don't know if people have come across that, it's quite, quite cute. Um, Love It Robot is very much designed to kind of elicit emotional attachments um, and also in Japan as well, the kind of way in which non-human um, agents may kind of attack, may, may acquire kind of spirit and um, yeah, so there's a lot of discussions there around how kind of we go beyond the sort of more traditional framings of 
how we live with technology and the more emotional sides of that. So that was quite interesting for us to give us kind of direction for this, this next project. I just thought I'd finish with um, some, some big picture kind of ethical concerns around this technology that may, you know, help think about some, some questions just in this last minute. Um, so, you know, some of the things that I'm quite concerned about would be, you know, the, the way in which, you know, if you're able to understand someone's, understand someone's emotional state, perhaps that's a new um, vector to try and push them and persuade them into particular ways of behaving. Um, it may enable new sort of design practices to try and capitalise on those. I think there's something very interesting around, um, you know, the fact that emotions are normally quite an ephemeral thing, yet in these technologies it's kind of being catalogued and can be um, assessed over time. Um, and also just coming back to that fundamental uncertainty here as to if emotions are actually even being engaged in the first place, given, as we saw, the, the disagreement from the, the psychology community. So yeah, that's just some, some various thoughts to and hopefully have points of discussion on later. But thank you for listening. Great, thank you, Lincoln. Uh, sorry, I just connected for, for a minute, but I succeeded to reconnect. It was really, really um, interesting, fascinating uh, presentation that really gave us like a historical perspective, but also a cross-cultural perspective with your presentation, Lincoln, uh, which I think is uh, quite interesting. So I would encourage the audience to um, ask some question uh, using the, the button um, on the webinar. And I might start uh, with a question myself, um, picking up on your last, last slide, uh, Lacan, on the ethical concern around facial recognition. Is this something that I can ask to the three of you, I guess? Um, and I, I think with the, the, obviously the, in the context of COVID-19 and the rise of like this surveillance technology, uh, I was curious to have your take on um, what do you think is the place for facial recognition in that? And what do you think is going to be the place for facial recognition in that? Um, so how it can be used and how do you think maybe um, it should be used or shouldn't be used? What, what, what do you worry and what are your concern maybe in terms of ethical concern and other concern in terms of um, the rise of these technologies maybe in the context of COVID-19 and the rise of surveillance technologies? Anybody? <laughs> um, Adam, I'm having a go. So, yeah. The, so, the ethical concern that we identified mainly in, in the unmasking facial recognition report was around meaningful consent, right? So, if you ask people, like generally, do you care about facial recognition? They might think of it on their phone where they're okay with it, or they might think of it in terms of um you know pictures being tagged on facebook which again they might be okay with a lot of the a lot of the one of the main differences between that kind of use of facial recognition and like the surveillance use of it is around being able to opt out and opt in primarily although some argue that it's still difficult to opt out on social media platforms and my main issue is do we even cross that line into facial recognition, which I consider to be far more like fingerprinting than I do CCTV. And what does that mean in terms of like the erosion of privacy, which previously, uh, you know, the only real private place now is our home, right? And even then you still have devices which could be switched on and listened to you. This is well documented with things like Alexa. Um, if you introduce facial recognition, that is essentially introducing a level of analysis that's akin to fingerprinting because everyone has their own individual face and that even though in the in England in, in London and the Metropolitan Police they have these signs which are placed up which says facial recognition is being used here and they assume that anyone who walks into that area is basically consenting uh, to being uh, scanned I think is a is a big problem and one of the issues I mentioned around the face veil I didn't really go into my presentation. Um, the face veil is obviously it's a really quite a very strong minority issue, but when it's worn willingly, it's a, it's quite a visible example of consent into what you're happy to share. And if you look at other European countries where, where um, face veils have been banned, they they're often phrased as though it's around secularism, but in reality, it's always 
uh, followed a debate around national security and in particular the effectiveness of CCTV. And this is a consequence which wasn't really thought about when CCTV was introduced and I think is another consequence that may arise if facial recognition becomes quite widespread. So I think a lot of it boils down to are we ever going to have meaningful consent to displaying our face or, or having privacy in the in the outside world or do we stop and say actually we don't want this at all no matter how accurate it is no matter how well it works um, and I, I would fall upon the side of saying we don't want this at all yeah it, it, it's a very good, good point yeah Benedetta. yeah I, I just wanted to add um uh, follow up following up on uh, what Eric, Eric just said um that i think uh it it um just mentioned uh that the only sphere the only um uh, the only sphere where we still have a little bit of privacy would be our own home, uh, except for all the devices that we all have, or most of us um, have. Uh, but I think there is a there is a novelty in um, the uh, current situation, uh, a novelty that the the pandemic has, um, I think, uh, boosted uh, is the inc uh, dramatic increase uh, of. Uh, our use of online interaction um, and, and video interaction, of course. So uh, not only, of course, we all used, uh, most of us already uh, were uh, using a laptop and probably um, already spending our professional life uh, online. What is happening now, and it has happened in the past six, eight months, um, is that our entire life, all uh, the spheres of our uh, life private and public and professional are uh, mediated by a camera and so um, I think it would be uh, interesting to uh, monitor exactly uh, the kind of implementations that this big company there are uh, uh, developing uh, video conferencing systems uh, which uh, you know uh, and we know that some of them already are um, have already been working on uh, uh, on uh, systems to uh, detect, for example, level of uh, attentiveness or uh, you know pick up on emotions and feelings in video conferencing uh, platforms uh, or in the workplace, for example. This is a, a tool. Um, uh, another thing, things that I'm researching on um, uh, that I haven't mentioned is that I'm looking at the patterns uh, of facial recognition and especially emotion recognition systems and one of the main uh, um, use of emotion recognition systems that use facial uh, recognition is in the workplace so the ability for the employer to monitor uh, uh, the um, productiveness and the productivity of, of the employees when uh, they are for example talking to a customer over a uh, uh, using a webcam so uh, all of this just to say uh, that um, all of this now apply to us and uh, and I think we are all aware of the fact that these tools are here to stay. We're still, we're gonna work, uh, we're gonna look at this camera for a long time, I think, um, now. So I think this is an interesting aspect that uh, we should uh, uh, monitor because I, uh, there's no consent, uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, there's, if I need to use a uh, video conferencing platform to work, there's no way that I can meaningful, uh, meaningfully uh, give any consent to whatever facial analysis, uh, um, you know, a function is implemented in that tool. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good point and I think it relates to our experience of the of the pandemic and yeah, this idea of consenting to using tools that now are widespread uh, in our workplaces is a, is a very good point. I have a question for you, Lachlan. Um, so, I, from, I, someone is, from the audience. Is it possible to come in on the, the previous question? It's got a couple of points. Is that okay? Or? Yeah, can I ask you the question so then you can go back to these two points? So the, the point we were talking about and uh, the question I'm asking, I'm just aware of the time and I want to take the audience question as well. So someone is asking, in a recent report, Amnesty International argues that emotional recognition implicitly pose a human to risk, um, a risk to human rights, sorry. However, I hear you saying that since emotion analysis on unidentified facial images does, does not result in bio, biometric data. I wonder what the risk to human rights, what, what's your take on the amnesty statement around that? Okay. Um, so I'll maybe, so take both points basically. Okay. Um, 
So I think the first one, I think to me, the thing that strikes me about how this stuff intersects with, with COVID is particularly around sort of limitations of mobility and how this technology might be used as some sort of enforcement mechanism to try and track movements of people. And I think that sort of solutionism of, you know, if we can see faces and where people have moved and at what time, is quite concerning because, you know, we do see that sort of approach to, well, this is new tech and this will do the job well. And as we know, that's not the case where it takes a long time to kind of iron out particular risks. So I think to me, um, concerns underpinning that would be the fact that often, you know, you might need the negotiability there to be able to say, you know, I was actually moving around for legitimate reasons. And sometimes that's very hard to do with sort of these automated systems where, well, you were present here at this time, therefore, actually, you shouldn't have been. And I think something that feeds into that is perhaps thinking more about the rule of law and the way in which the rules keep changing. And actually, people sometimes might not be aware of what, you know, what people do read the news every day, but sometimes people just don't keep up with the ever-changing landscape as to what is and isn't permitted um, at different times. So I do think, you know, there's some questions there around if this was to be used in a way to enforce stopping people moving from A to B, you know, how do you put in place re review processes that ensure that you kind of deal with some of the risks there from the automated side um, of using it at scale? Um, I think, yeah, very much so. I think, we're, you know, in part, some of the work we're doing is trying to map out and think about the, the human rights risks that, that emerge from this type of technology. And I think because it is so so new and a lot of the, the use cases are very much um, only coming now, um, I think, you know, it's, it's, I think facial recognition in some ways there's the benefit that it's we've had some test cases and we've really been able to dig into practical implementations of this stuff. Um, and I think that with, um, with, with emotional AI, we're still trying to kind of forecast some of these issues. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, to me, the, the data protection side just is kind of where I came at it from, given my background, but I think it'd be very interesting to see what sort of human rights lawyers more generally think are the, the risks that are posed by this technology and what we should be doing about it and how it might impact other things such as freedom, freedom of assembly and um, you know, freedom of speech in particular as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different ground to cover here with it being so new. Here's a follow-up one uh, from Robbie for Lachlan. Um, says, Lachlan, I know your colleague, Andrew McStay, has argued for an understanding of privacy, which focuses on the value of intimacy, as well as the focus of identification. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the importance and usefulness of intimacy as a value for potentially pushing back against intrusive uses of facial recognition. Um, intimacy is perhaps a value invoked by those in Japan who argue facial recognition technology is disrespectful. Yeah, I think I think I think Robbie's question probably captures the answer as well. I mean, I think it is a very valuable, um, a very very valuable framing for thinking about this, and it kind of gets us beyond the limitations of, um, you know, at least within data protection law, the focus on um, identification-based harms and tries to get us thinking a little bit more holistically, as we would maybe do if we're looking more towards privacy as as conceptualised in sort of Article Eight BCHR and and that sort of jurisprudence. Um, so I think, yes, I think the sort of the intimacy side of things is very much something that I think could be um, incorporated in those discussions, looking um, more broadly from the human rights side on, on right to privacy, as opposed to maybe the narrower um, data protection focus on um, personal data and identification based harm. So I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot of scope for digging into to the case law and, and seeing, you know, how, how can we maybe give that um, concept more, more weight. Um, in this particular context of motion sensing. So yeah, I think it's a really interesting um, framing. Okay, great, thank you. And um, I'll open this one up to um, everybody, really, whoever would like to respond. This is a question from um, Stergios. Uh, apart from a generational ban, are there any other safeguards that we should prioritize establishing um, with regard to facial recognition technology? What would they be like? Um, perhaps co-designed legal technical solutions, more accountability. Anybody want to speak to that one? Um, so in our Sorry. report, we also include uh, nine recommendations uh, in addition to the generational ban. So the generational ban is the main recommendation of it. And then the other nine are recommendations uh, which um, we advise should be put in place if facial recognition does become mainstream. And those are things like having mandatory quality impact assessments 
uh, before any trials and implementations, the collection and reporting of ethnicity, ethnicity data. And so this could be like in a surveillance context, who are you stopping? Um, who's being flagged uh, uh, on the cameras, which is a really, really difficult to detect. Uh, the publication of algorithms, a lot, a lot on transparency, regular audits, given that the technology can change over time. Um, also, diversity reporting for third party developers. So one of the arguments in the report is that if um, it doesn't just apply to facial recognition, actually, but one of the um, themes of the report was just the privatization of policing and the inclusion of um, developers into the criminal justice system. And if we accept that in the future, should we not also apply more scrutiny to who's involved in those uh, organizations, who's involved in the design and development of these new tools? And using an estimate from an organization called Color in Tech, uh, which I think estimates that the tech sector is 4% BAME, that would place the tech sector as the least diverse part of the UK's criminal justice system less diverse than the police, less, di less diverse than the judiciary, uh, less diverse than uh, the CPS, the Criminal Prosecution Service. Uh, and therefore, should we not also think about setting targets for any developers we want to include uh, in the criminal justice system or policing? But also things like um, legal protections for religious minorities, so that no one would ever have to be forced to show their face um, to a facial recognition camera. Also looking at things like a fair trade approach. So like what Benedetta talks about workers' rights, how are these systems actually being developed? Are, are we tracing back uh, to the very beginnings of these facial recognition systems? There's reports of um, these systems being tested on Uyghur Muslims or uh, people living in occupied territories uh, in Israel, Palestine. And that's just another element of, you know, the kind of, limitations and regulations that we recommend we should also have on facial recognition but that's only if we implement it our, our main uh, core we still think should be for uh, just a full stop generational ban on the technology for policing so before considering whether consent should be thought uh, sought how are people going to be made aware of what the data is going to be used for why is it requested where is it going to be used how long is it going to be kept Etc. We, the public, need to know much more before we can give any kind of meaningful consent. I guess there's not really a question, but maybe you would like to pick up on that and comment on this comment from the audience in, yeah, uh, in relation to meaningful consent and maybe the use of data, the collection of data, how long is it kept, the data storage, data stewardship, all these sort of questions that are the data infrastructure that are underlying uh, facial recognition technology, and I guess. Uh, also privacy and uh, digital rights and so on? I mean, I think it's very much, you know, if, if there's processing personal data, then there is obviously, you know, to have uh, meaningful consent and within the, the, the terms of how it's framed in the GDPR, then, you know, a lot of those things are, are very much um, built into the framework already. But I think how it's implemented obviously is the challenge. But I think something as well that's interesting is what we're seeing maybe with the sort of the white paper of the, of the uh, the EU AI white paper and how it's trying to kind of put in place um, more of a, a regulatory framework around things like you know the training data and yeah so obviously that's not necessarily as far as I understand constrained to, to just dealing with personal data and it's trying to put in place like, things like you know more information provision um, you know to try and um, provide people with more more understanding when it's particularly high high risk uses of, of AI systems which I would say very much in facial recognition and things would would be deemed as such so um, you know to try and give citizens more information about what's actually going on under uh, underpinning this how you know what are the different characteristics that have underpinned how data was was selected for training and what methodologies were used what were the processes and techniques that were kind of underpinning the building and validating these systems and trying to build that record keeping infrastructure um into this for these, these more higher risk um, deployments so i think from a regulatory perspective at least that seems to be where, where we're heading and um, from the from the eu side so i think yeah that and that would broaden it out beyond perhaps just relying on on gdpr and personal data focused and protections which can sometimes only go so far. 
Thank you, Lachlan. I guess there are more questions in the context of, of Brexit, but we gave Eric and Benedetta maybe a chance to answer to this um, question around uh, meaningful consent, and then maybe we can draw the seminar to a close. So maybe Eric uh, first, if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I think I think the problem with facial recognition, I mean, I'm only talking about surveillance, obviously, in public places. It's going to be impossible, really, to get meaningful consent no matter what you know process that the police comes up with like this current system that they use where they signpost where facial recognition is being used that's not going to last forever right that's going to last for a couple of years until it becomes more mainstream otherwise it undermines the point which is in their view to to catch criminals right you can't they're not gonna be able to catch criminals if criminals know exactly where the, the most surveillance is going to be taking place. Equally, this is why I think the argument around uh, the need for there to be protections uh, for people to actively not show their face. Right? So if someone wants to cover their face, they should be able to, because that's the only real way of showing uh, consent. And there was a really, um, I don't know if you saw the viral video uh, that the BBC did where they caught a man uh, being fined who, who walked past a facial recognition camera whilst covering his face and the police said he was fine because of the way he spoke to the police but ultimately they asked him to, to remove his scarf and that created some sort of tension so that is a really interesting example of even if the laws are in place so the implementation might be very different um, so there is a really a need to think about what practical measures can people use to show consent and that really is covering their face um because in the long term there aren't going to be these these sign postings there aren't going to be any kind of you know public conversation around it they'll just it'll just be there right uh, so it's a really difficult question really uh, how do you get that kind of meaningful consent and if you look at again you know european countries where they banned the face veil they banned it on this uh you know on this in this context of surveillance and how it undermines cctv and when, where we've seen it in the uk as well where we've seen conversation on face file bands in the UK, it's always been in the context of CCTV surveillance. When facial recognition comes, that's going to accelerate uh, significantly. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, and Benedetta, do, do you want to add a final word? It's a really good question. And I think Eric just mentioned some of the uh, main problems with defining consent uh, when it comes to facial recognition and uh, the idea that one should be able to not show um, their face. Uh, another um, important element of this conversation is the fact that, um, as we have uh, uh, mentioned uh, during this conversation altogether, uh, is that uh, facial recognition and emotional recognition are tools that are not only employed by law authorities but also implemented in uh, uh, um, services and uh, you know, deployed by private companies to use uh, and access services, uh, uh, and these are becoming progressively uh, more difficult to avoid. Um, so it, it, it is becoming more difficult to uh, be part of the professional, you know, life uh, um, and uh, public life without accessing these uh, uh, tools. Uh, or even accessing uh, jobs, uh, if you think that the incredible uh, number of people who rely on, for example, geek labor, and so digital infrastructure is absolutely necessary for them to be part of um, uh, labor force. And so when these uh, uh, tools become, uh, um, uh, are deeply embedded in uh, the social structure and we add facial recognition to this, it's becoming, uh, really difficult to uh, understand exactly where's the line uh, between giving consent or not, because I don't think it's a conversation about consent anymore. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a great question. And again, to me, it comes to, um, to me, it comes to design and building technologies. And uh, of course, it's not, I'm not saying that the uh, responsibility is on uh, the developer themselves, of course, this is a uh, practice uh, that we do as a society, um, building technologies. And so I think we should take into account all these steps uh, altogether when we try to define um, what is consent or not. This is great, great last words. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm afraid that uh, unfortunately all we have time for today. 
And uh, I start hearing echo. But anyway, I would like to thank um, you. To thank all speakers, uh, I think they were really uh, engaging and provoking presentation and hopefully also an engaging conversation. I uh, apologize if I dropped a few times, my internet connection apparently is not that good here. Um, I also would like to thank the audience for connecting to our events and also for the question. I'm sorry if we haven't taken all the questions here, um, but we don't have um, any uh, time um, left. Please check out the, our website for more information about future events, also about what we do and how to get involved and more around digital issues and probably more to come about uh, facial recognition as well, as it's a very topical uh, issue at the moment. So thank you again, everyone, and I hope uh, you have a nice uh, evening. Thank you to you too for organizing. Thank you.